and I'm excited to introduce a law panel as well. I work with lawyers every day, couldn't do my job without them. Um, BlackRock, uh, as I mentioned, we're a financial services company. We're actually the largest asset management company in the world. Most people don't know that. We manage about $6.3, $6.5 trillion of assets. We invest in public stocks, bonds, and alternative investments. Alternative investments include real estate, private equity, hedge funds, private credit. <clears throat> I run a team of about um, 45 investment professionals, and we invest in private companies globally. We, we manage about $30 billion in private equity, and uh, Taylor and Grace are here today with me. Freshly, in the last two years, graduated from college, University of Virginia, MIT, and they have chosen a career in financial services. So I have a short video uh, promoting BlackRock. We're really here to talk about legal, but thank you guys for allowing me to do a two-minute clip on uh, financial services. When I was first setting out to think of my career, I wasn't actually thinking of a career in financial services. I wanted to find one where I could impact the world and our community. So I knew I was good at math. I knew I wanted to work in an industry that was big and important and affected different parts of the economy. When I was in college, I decided to pursue a career in financial services because I liked two things. I liked to communicate with other people and I loved math and finance. Only through an internship did I realize that being in financial services, I can actually impact a larger community of people. I chose a career in financial services because I've always loved to negotiate. I'm really excited about the intersection between math and real world problems and helping people build a better financial future. So although I find markets and finance interesting, the thing I love most about my job is the people I get to work with. In financial services, you meet so many different people from different backgrounds, people that speak different languages. What I love about my job is that it presents new challenges to tackle every single day. I like the ability that it gives me to practice quantitative and qualitative skills and always be learning about different industries. It really gives me the chance to empower investors to use their voice for good, especially with all of the changes going on in the world right now. I love the fact that I'm able to help people go to college, buy a home, and invest for the future. And the advice that I'd give to you is to work hard, be confident, and never be afraid to voice your good ideas. Don't be afraid of applying to a job in financial services because it seems complicated or because you don't know that much about it. I personally didn't know much about finance until I was in college. So if you're interested in the field, just apply. Talk to a wide group of people to get to know what they like about their job and what they don't like about their job. And at the end of the day, just to take a chance and see if it's something that you may like to do. I think it's really important for young women starting a career in financial services to find a mentor who they can have a really honest conversation with. Spend time deepening the personal relationships you have with other adults in your life. You should use failure as your fuel. I feel like sometimes we as women are super hard on ourselves, but nobody's perfect. And instead of using those failures and mistakes to define you, you should use them to motivate you. So thank you so much for um, allowing BlackRock to sponsor this event. We're really uh, focused on promoting women in financial services. We have really aspirational goals to have 30% of our uh, investors, be women, managing directors and directors, be female. So um, if you're interested in learning more, we have a booth outside. We also have some nice little gifts for everyone. And I'll end there. So the real panel is this, these great women who are in the legal field. So Lorraine McGowan, come up and introduce everyone. Thank you.
restructuring work, which is in the financial uh, services industry. Uh, in the last few years, I have represented Toyota, which was the largest uh, 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 purchaser of airbags from Takata, um, the maker of the defective airbags. I'm also on the management committee of my law firm, and I also co-chair our diversity and inclusion initiatives. Um, and so with that background, uh, I'll introduce our panelists and ask them to give um, a little bit of information about themselves, their practice, and uh, how they started, uh, how they chose the practice area that they are in. Um, to my left is Catherine Van Camp Campen, who's an associate at Bernstein, um, uh, Leowitz, Berger, and Grossman, um, and she does commercial litigation. Mm -hmm. um, and we are really fortunate to have with us Justice Ann Murray Patterson, who is a Stewart alum, um, and before she became a Justice of the New Jersey Supreme Court, she was a partner um, and did uh, commercial litigation on a law firm here in New Jersey. Um, and to her left is Noel Ix, who's a partner at Pepper Hamilton, and she also does commercial litigation, um, specializing in health sciences. But with that, perhaps each of you could spend a little bit telling us about yourself and how you became the, um, and chose the practice areas that you're <laughs> So good morning, everyone. I'm Catherine Van Campen. I'm delighted to be here at Stork. Um, I'm also an alum of 1984. So I uh, came back uh, last year um, to be with Dr. Fagan during the alumni weekend. Um, I actually am a second career person, so law was not my first career. Uh, marketing and public relations in global at a global advertising in New York City. Uh, was my first career where I worked with international clients and I traveled all the time and I was going to law school at night at Seton Hall uh, and I was also starting a family and kept having to go into the Dean at Seton Hall Law School and tell him I was pregnant again um, but he was a very generous uh, um, understanding Dean and gave me some extra time to get through law school after during law school my last semester I uh, was an intern at the Center for Social Justice. I worked with immigrant women who were uh, victims of uh, abandonment and violence, and then went on to clerk for um, Supreme Court, no, sorry, not Supreme Court, you're the Supreme Court, um, Superior Court Justice Margaret uh, McVeigh. Yeah, terrific judge, first uh, female judge in Psy County. And I actually heard you uh, orally argue in front of Judge uh -oh. McVeigh oh 20 years ago oh on a UCC case. I'll never forget it. Um, so that was uh, a wonderful experience seeing you. I was prepared that you, day. You <laughs> were. You, you, were a, Good you were phenomenal. The tiger. Um, <laughs> terrific. And, and then uh, after I clerked, I actually stayed home. Um, I got pregnant during my clerkship third baby and um, I stayed home for a year and a half my old job called me and said would you like to come back I said yes and then I continued I ended up being in-house counsel for a small advertising agency in New York City and I was still traveling a lot and I said you know what I'm done with this I want to be with my children and I segued into law um, I uh, the how I ended up in the litigation space is that I actually am also fluent in Dutch, which is a very, very few spe uh, people actually learn Dutch if you're not a native speaker. And uh, a law firm, Bernstein Lewitz <laughs> in New York, had a Belgian case that my uh, company, they had a client, uh, Microsoft had invested in this voice technology um, and the c Belgian company had committed massive fraud. All these pension funds had invested in this company, and they, the Bernstein Litowitz was one of the lead law firms uh, investigating the fraud and trying to recover some money for the American investors, and I put my resume out on monster.com, uh, which you probably don't know because it's probably obsolete at this point, but um, I got a call. LinkedIn, um, now. LinkedIn yeah, right. LinkedIn um, immediately from this law, the recruiter at the law firm, they said, we've been looking for you for six months. 
And in that, I was so lucky. I worked for them for three years, then went to a couple uh, firms down on uh, Wall Street where the department, for the Department of Justice, they were investigating uh, more Dutch companies, unfortunately. Um, so, and then I went back to Bernstein Litowitz. I spent 10 years in their litigation group, and now I manage in the claim settlement group. Uh, they, Bernstein Litowitz has recovered $32 billion in uh, uh, funds. Uh, that were fraudulently obtained, um, and we bring them back to the institutional investors, the pension funds, and even the individual investors. Um, so that's kind of my career in a nutshell. That's great. That is terrific. Thank you. This is shows you, in law, you always meet people again. <laughs> Everybody who you ever met comes back into your life. Isn't yes. that true? Yeah. It really is true. Um, I, I was one of the first students uh, uh, to start at Stewart the day it opened. 1963. That sounds like Lincoln must have been president, but it's pretty close. <laughs> um, and uh, I stayed uh, through through uh, graduation. Had a wonderful career at Stewart. So my my interest in law, excuse me, started at this building, and I was you know history classes, social studies, um, learning about how important lawyers are in in America and elsewhere. And so I went on to Dartmouth to Cornell uh, Law. Met my husband at Dartmouth. We we both decided to go to Cornell, which worked out really well for us. Um, got married right after we finished uh, finished law school, um, and went on to Riker Danzig, of, which is a firm in Morristown. My plan had been, uh, with the extreme encouragement of my parents, who didn't want me more than ten minutes away, to come back to Trenton or Princeton uh, to, to practice. But I was told, just uh, go to one of the bigger firms in New Jersey for a couple of years and then come back. And I went up to Morristown. Newark and Morristown, where, where my firm had its offices, um, and expecting to temporarily be there for a couple of years, and um, I had incredible uh, work there, and two years in, a, a gentleman who, if you read the history of the 1960s, is a pretty prominent name, Nicholas Katzenbach, a um, former U.S. Attorney General, one of the architects of the civil rights uh, legislation that went through Congress, U.S. Attorney General under LBJ, worked for JFK and very, very close with Robert Kennedy. He retired and joined my firm, and my firm asked me, do you want to be his main associate? Okay. Um, and I never left. Uh, I worked with Nick for, for 10 years um, and had a wonderful friendship with him. Um, the last real event he went to uh, was my swearing in for the, at the Supreme Court just before he passed away. Um, so uh, I, I my, one of the other partners I worked for became New Jersey Attorney General when I was an associate and said, do you want to go into government for a couple of years? I mean, he knew his time there would be limited. I did spend two years in Trenton at the AG's office, not quite two years. Um, came back to Riker, became a partner. And my most of my practice, I did commercial litigation. I did a lot of different things. The, most of my practice as time went on was in um, representing pharmaceutical companies, obviously a very strong industry in New Jersey, um, in product liability litigation. And the, the interesting thing about that is it's science. Um, and I had, I had um, in college, taken those easy science courses for, for, social, sci for, for social science majors, you know, something about the planets or whatever, the easy stuff. What I really, one of my few regrets is I, I wish I, I got a great grounding in science here at Stewart. I wish I had gone on to take some serious biology courses in college because I ended up working a lot with physicians and, and uh, scientists, researchers um, in the pharmaceutical industry, and I, I, I really did have to learn kind of on the job. But law, one of the things about law is it's so exciting because you are constantly learning. Um, you are learn, and I, I think probably in your industry it's it's something very similar. You're dealing with people who make things, who develop things, who have great ideas, and you have to learn enough about what they do, um, which in order to be able to articulate it and to present it in court potentially, um, to understand it, because when you're dealing with expert witnesses or scientists, they're going to find out really quickly if you don't understand what the concepts are. And that keeps you interested. It makes you, it's almost like constantly being in an academic environment. So fast forward a lot of years, um, uh, Governor Christie, with whom I had worked on cases um, many, many years, 20 plus years before, uh, nominated me to be on the State Supreme Court. And our State Supreme Court is um, you 
know, obviously I'm, I'm uh, not exactly objective in saying this, but I think it's one of the strongest state Supreme Courts in the country. It has a wonderful history. There's seven of us, um, and we hear cases, uh, an incredible variety of cases. Um, uh, we are very busy. Um, I am working every bit as hard as I did in, in the, you know, at exam time at Stewart and college and throughout law school, uh, but I am so excited. Your caseload is larger than the Supreme, U.S. Supreme Court. It, 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 won, it measured by, by the number of appeals, it is a little bit larger. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, so um, I've had a, just a tremendously exciting career. So, and I, um, I hope that, that all of you uh, will consider, the young people in the room, and people who might be interested in a second career, um, will consider law as a career for you. It's just the best. So, Noah, you're in the health sciences area. So, um, my name's Noelle X. My, I have two daughters at Stewart. Catherine is in 10th grade, and Emily's in 8th grade. Um, I went to an all-girls Catholic school just like Stewart outside of Philadelphia. And while I was in high school, I thought I wanted to go to law school because I loved English and history. I love to read and write, and I was heavily involved in our public speaking and debate club from the time I was in sixth grade through 12th grade. I went to a small Catholic school up in Worcester, Massachusetts, Holy Cross, and um, continued in my outside activities to focus on writing and public speaking, and I was an English major. I thought that I wanted to practice law back um, near my home to be near my parents, so I went to law school at Villanova, um, and had three of the best years of my life. I met uh, some of my best friends that I have today while I was in law school. It was a terrific place to go to school. I clerked for a federal district court judge, which is a trial level judge uh, in Wilmington, Delaware for a year, Joseph Farnan, uh, which was a, uh, one of the best years of my career. I learned so much about effective advocacy, brief writing, and um, had the opportunity to see really good litigators in action during the year that I spent uh, clerking. I uh, then applied to larger law firms in Philadelphia, thinking that maybe I'd be at a big firm for a few years, and I got an offer from Pepper Hamilton, where I've been for 25 years. Um, at the time, Pepper was the third biggest firm in the city. Uh, there, the two larger firms, um, had more of an international presence. I had offers from those firms, but I chose Pepper for a couple of reasons. First, uh, there were more women partners at Pepper and more women in leadership positions than any other firm in the city at the time, and uh, that was a really good decision for me in the long run. Uh, I really liked the people that I met at Pepper, and uh, at the time, which was unusual, it had um, a very serious expectation that all of the lawyers in the firm would do pro bono work. So at the time, um, just like here at Stewart, the girls in the upper school are required to do 50 hours of pro bono work at our firm 25 years ago and, and today, all of the lawyers are expected to do 50 hours of pro bono work, and pro bono work is providing legal services to people and individual to individuals and organizations that can't afford legal services on their own. So I uh, stayed at Pepper uh, for nine years and um, made partner in my ninth year and took a few years off when my children, my daughters were young. I wasn't sure if I was going, I, uh, at the time I <coughs> went to my uh, and said I'd like to withdraw from the partnership because I'm not sure if I'm going to come back in the long run. And she said, why don't you just not withdraw from the partnership, stay a partner, and if you come back in a year or a few years, you know, we'd love to have you. <coughs> so five years later, I came back, and um, we had since moved to Princeton. We had an office in the Princeton area, so I've been working at Princeton just like Justice uh, Patterson, I have spent almost my entire career working on product liability litigation, mostly for pharmaceutical companies and medical device companies. Just like Justice Patterson said, the reason that I love it is because I'm learning every day. <coughs> I work with doctors and researchers, um, learning about the business that, um, that they are in and constantly learning about science, which is, has always been a real interest of mine. Um, so 
So uh, taking a step back, product liability litigation is uh, cases in which people, you see it on TV all the time, uh, plaintiff's lawyers advertising for cases. It's lawyer, uh, cases that people bring against companies who are injured by um, products that they use, whether it's automobiles or tires or um, pharma uh, pharmaceuticals. Um, and so the reason that I've really enjoyed staying at Pepper is uh, because I really still like the people that I work with. They have similar values to me. It was, uh, there are women and people, you know, individuals at my firm who want to focus on their family and there's a place for that in that firm. They prioritize that and it's been a really great place for me uh, to be a lawyer. So the film that we saw um, emphasized having mentors and sponsors. Um, did each of you have mentors or sponsors that helped you in your career and who were some of your mentors or sponsors and how did you obtain a mentor or sponsor? Okay, I'll, I'll take that one. Um, so in my first career, my advertising career, um, I actually started out, I was 23 maybe and I had the two worst male bosses one could imagine other than that they wanted me to work really hard so I learned a lot but they weren't great mentors I then they both left uh, the, the uh, advertising agency and I ended up getting the best mentor for over 10 years a, a male um, who was just so uh, supportive of everything I did um, when I after uh, law school, when I clerked for Judge McVeigh, um, what, the first thing, uh, what first weeks of oral, oral argument, uh, I went in and I said, you know, I'm, I've never practiced at a law firm. I, you know, come out of the advertising world. I don't know how, read these briefs, these motions, legal research, and she said, just go to your room and figure it out. And I said, wow, she's really mean. <laughs> and, um, and that's what I did. And I just sat there and hunkered down in my room and kept going to the law library, coming back. Um, and so even though she was extremely tough, uh, it was the best mentoring that I had. Uh, I initially didn't appreciate it, um, only because I wanted a little hand holding and coddling, which she wasn't willing to give. Um, but it was, a good ex it was a great experience, actually, and she is a lifelong friend. Um, someone I really respect. Um, in When I transitioned into working at Bernstein Litowitz, I didn't really have a mentor, but I had uh, my, wor my work ethic and I had my work experience from uh, my advertising career, which I knew if you wanted to succeed, you just had to continue to work really hard persevere and be very committed to your your success and part of what I was talking to Dr. Fagan about yesterday at lunch was uh, your willingness to speak up and to push work forward um, and as a female with not a great uh, legal uh, background in terms of having worked at a law firm and being an associate I was on these litigation teams and I was working for two male partners who were litigating a healthcare case. And I just kept pushing evidence forward of fraud that had taken place. And they kept saying, I love this woman's work. I love her work. I love her work. And then they made me a team leader. And suddenly during the financial crisis, I was um, managing teams of 50, 60 attorneys all across the country working on very complicated financial fraud litigation. Um, and so they were my mentors. And subsequently, last year, those same gentlemen promoted me to run the uh, settlement department, where I manage about $3 billion in, in funds. So um, I haven't had um, necessarily a formal mentorship, but I found uh, mentors in some of the uh, folks who I worked for. Um, the, in, in law today, and especially in the bigger firms, I think it's fair to say there will be, there, there will be sort of institutional ways to get mentors. Mm -hmm. the, 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 our profession is so so much more aware, I think, than it, than it was years ago of the importance, not only for young women lawyers, but young men, um, uh, to to have someone that they need, they can speak to and get advice from. And so you will you will find, if you go into law, beginning in, 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 the legal, in law school, that there is really 
there are formal ways to get a mentor. That, 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 and that is a wonderful thing. I think ultimately mentoring relationships, however, in our profession, by and large, are the result of working together on substantive projects. Mm -hmm. And so as students, you can almost get into practice for how to be effective in finding a mentor in, in, um, in being interested in the projects that your teachers are introducing to you, taking on extra work, um, being willing to do you know, extra credit type projects or, or, or just go beyond the, the, the classroom curriculum because that's a way to, um, to let your teachers know how interested you are. You'll learn more, obviously. And, and those mentoring relationships when you get into uh, the working <coughs> world are, are very much the product of being willing to take on extra work, do the pr project that you really didn't think you had time for, because that everybody's under pressure to get the work done for clients, and you can, um, you can really forge a bond with someone through, uh, through sometimes more, the more difficult projects that are there. So there are formal ways to, to get mentors in our profession is very, very much attuned to that and we'll, we'll make those, uh, those opportunities available to you. But to me, the best relationships are those that are, um, are the result of working together. And those are, um, you know, I think for all of us who've had wonderful mentors, and I've had wonderful women mentors and, and men mentors, um, we are all very much interested in passing that on and to, to be as effective as we can be as mentors. So at our firm, just like Justice Patterson said, at our firm, we assign, for every young associate that comes into the firm, we assign not only a partner mentor, but also a senior associate mentor. And the firm is constantly looking for natural connections that those people might have. But when you start out in the law or in any industry, you should look for the, the, the traits that I looked for as a, men, um, as a young associate were people who I liked, people who I wanted to work for, and people who effectively managed, uh, mentored other young associates, who were interested in teaching other young associates. I had one mentor in particular who was a teacher. He was, um, his former profession was in teaching, and he loved teaching young associates. So he would spend countless hours teaching us not only what we were doing, but why he was doing what he was doing. And he always was looking for opportunities to give young associates opportunities to do things. So um, when there was a deposition, he would say, this deposition is coming up, and why don't you come with me to this doctor's dep, and then you can do the next one on your own. And if you weren't ready to do it, you'd, I'd say to him, I don't feel ready, I'd like to go to one more. And he'd take me with him to the next one, and then I'd go and do the one um, by myself. In addition to looking for mentors within your firm or your company, it's also smart to look outside your company. So get involved in professional organizations outside of your firm or company and look for mentors in those settings. Some of the most important mentors that I have are people that I met in different um, ends of court and other organizations outside of my law firm who helped me see that there were different opportunities other than just in the microcosm in which I was working. After you graduate from high school, college, and law school, stay in touch with your friends. Go back to reunions. Go out to lunch and dinner with those uh, people that you were friends with and people who you might not have been friends with because you have such natural connections with those people and those people can be some of the most important people not only in your life but in your career. Become involved in your alumni organizations. You will meet alums in all stages of their career who can give you really good advice about not only your industry, but maybe even thinking about different industries that you might pursue if the one that you've chosen wasn't the right fit. So the practice of law is actually changing, uh, particularly big law. Um, what advice would you give to young women who are thinking about going into the law? So what kinds of courses because you, each of you have mentioned some of the courses that you took in high school and in college. What kinds of courses would you recommend uh, young women who are thinking about considering a legal career they take? I, can, uh, I actually don't think there is a formula. Uh, the, 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 the skills, in, at least in the litigation part of law, um, that you need are 
strong writing and the ability to express yourself and the ability to work with people effectively, the collegiality of our profession is something that's very important. And I think you can develop those skills um, in, um, in English courses, history courses, science courses, extracurricular activities. Um, but there are so many ways to develop those. In, in, when I was at Dartmouth, there was a, 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 law, a constitutional law course with a kind of a growly older professor, and he would say, don't take my course if you're going to law school. Um, he, said, he, he said, I want you to take this and that and the other thing, because you're gonna get a lot of this when you go to law school. Uh, he didn't keep all the pre-law students out, needless to say, there were, there were covert pre-law students in the course <laughs> who just didn't say they were going to law school. I won't say who that might be. Um, but but it was, uh, it, it, there are so many ways to, to develop the skills that you need. So I think, you know, take science, take math. Um, um, it, it, things come back, and you talk about learning. Uh, I, I took calculus here um, I, and uh, got out of, you know, placed sort of out of calculus in college. I was like, okay, I'm done with calculus. Well, well, 15, 20 years later, I'm sitting with a new case coming up about computer chips. I'm sitting um, in, a, in a classroom, and, and somebody who seemed an awful lot like my calculus teacher here was talking about sine and cosine, and I'm thinking, oh my god, I thought it was done. Um, but good example, take, take all different courses. Pick up as many skills as you can with an eye toward courses that will give you a lot of writing ability and courses that will challenge you to, to get up on your feet and express yourself. The only thing I'd like to add to that is um, take, uh, I think a liberal arts education is a really good education in terms of choosing a college because what um, we do every day is we're constantly learning about new businesses and new things. Mm -hmm. So if you learn how to learn, mm -hmm. that is I think the best, um, the best approach. And um, and also, uh, just like Justice Patterson was saying, there there really is no formula. So, like I said, I was interested in being a lawyer in high school. So my mother thought it would be a really good idea for me to take Spanish because she thought that maybe I'd really be able to help a large population of people someday in the future. That because of the direction that our country was moving towards, and so I have spent so much of my so I became very proficient in Spanish. And I spent probably 10 years of my career sitting in a conference room with French translators because two of the largest companies that I worked with were Michelin on tire product liability cases and a French company that manufactured implants for spinal, um, for spinal products. And so it, it, the Spanish never really suited me, but because I um, because I learned how to learn in a lot of different areas, that I think is what has helped me the most. So I completely agree with both of you. Uh, one thing I would say, if you're considering going to law school, undergraduate, um, college undergraduate career, you should really focus on having a great, uh, as great as possible GPA and extracurricular activities. If, for example, you have to do undergrad and work, that's something that law school applications, uh, sorry, the law school admissions offices will look at. That was definitely my case. Um, uh, I went to law school at night, so I went to school with folks who already had other graduate degrees. They had masters uh, in international relations. Um, they were accountants, so they were CPAs. Uh, I had a guy who went to, uh, two of my friends, one ended up working at Goldman Sachs and the other one Brown Brothers Harriman. They both had their MBAs um, in addition to, and, and then they went on to get their uh, law degree. So um, you can already have a professional degree and license and supplement that with a law degree. Uh, additionally, if you're an undergrad, one thing that a lot of colleges are offering now is the dual degree or the five-year program. So for example, Seton Hall has a JD MBA program or a master's in international studies in law. So those are types of things that um, you know keep your options open, but it is really important to, to study very hard and do, do well. I'm not saying you have to have a 4.0, but they do want a good GPA and a good LSAT, um, is an, or an LSAT uh, score is also important. So 
I want to let the audience uh, raise questions, but the video also raised one other um, issue that I wanted to get uh, each of the panelists' thoughts on, and that is learning from mistakes um, and, and not being afraid to learn from failure. So have any of you had an experience where you made a mistake early in your career and learned from it? So I think my biggest mistake in, in going into law was not planning for the transition properly. Um, what both of you said about mentoring, staying in touch with people, um, not t t with your peers and, and uh, your classmates, um, also old associates, th those things are actually keep taking time to have coffee with folks and lunch. Those are really, really important soft skills that you need to um, be willing to utilize and put yourself out there. So I got lucky. My sister-in-law worked at uh, uh, World Corp, uh, News Corp. Uh, she was working at Fox and she said, in a human resource, she said, just put your resume out there. I put it out there and it happened to be that a law firm in Midtown Manhattan needed a, an American barred lawyer who read Dutch fluently, and that was me. That was pure luck. Um, but then after three years when that case ended and I needed to find something, you know, a place for myself, I had to hustle. And what, what happened to me was because I hadn't kept up some of those important contacts, I had to work even harder. Instead of being able to just shoot somebody an email or pick up the phone, I didn't have that. Um, and I, again, got lucky because of language skills um, and some fraud uh, committed by some Dutch companies, so thank goodness for that. Um, I ended up at Sullivan and Cromwell, which is a phenomenal firm down on Wall Street, and then also Thatcher, Profit & Wood, which is also down on Wall Street, and I worked for Greenberg Torek here in New Jersey, um, and all different uh, components of finance, financial fraud. Um, and I was a poli-sci or history major. I was not, I, I like math and I, uh, and I love finance and I love the, compo the financial litigation stuff that I do now, but it was not my background. Um, but so I planned very poorly for my tr uh, transition and I admit it, and I just got really lucky. Well, I, it, it, it's, uh, it's not original with me, but boy, everybody makes mistakes. Everybody makes it. You make them in school, you make them in, in, in work, make them in, sometimes in your personal life. There is nobody out there, and I've, I've been able to work with some unbelievable people who, who, who doesn't have a, a, a goof up in their history. And the key thing is, and, and, and as a young lawyer, I, I still vividly remember a couple of times I, I, my, I prepared papers wrong. Something was missing, something was off. And in my own mind, I exaggerated that to be just, just the Titanic. Um, uh, but but it, 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 the other thing you learn is that if you're honest about the, the, the error and you move as quickly as you can to correct it, um, it's, it nothing is uh, as serious as, as it seems in the beginning. Where lawyers get in trouble, uh, and, and you know part of our job is, uh, on our court is is discipline of lawyers, some, sometimes disbarment of lawyers who have have um, uh, committed ethical. Uh, trend, uh, Fractions. Lawyers get in trouble with cover-ups, with not taking responsibility for mistakes, with with uh, trying to blame somebody down the food chain, and that is just as in politics, just as in, in many areas, um, that it, that turns out to be the more serious thing. So you're going to make mistakes. Nobody's perfect. As a young lawyer, you're really expected to make mistakes. That's why you have senior associates and firms and and partners and mentors who will work with you to, to, to prevent them, but also they get made and they also get rectified and, and fixed. And so, you don't always, and you don't lose your job. And you don't lose your job. <laughs> and you know, I still remember losing a lot of sleep over, over just an error that I made um, that, that turned out to be a big nothing, but you know, I think I probably aged a year in, in the week that it took to have that resolved. And that's just, that's just normal. Um, Part of that is good because you really realize up the work you do, the careful attention to detail, 
is so important. And, and just as in school, you're, you're preparing a paper and you, 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 you make sure it is just right before you hand it in, um, it's a, that's a lot less stressful than getting it back and realizing that you, you have a, 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 you know, a serious typo or something like that or a mistake in there that, that, that you wish you, you hadn't made. But they're gonna, get, they're gonna get made and they're gonna be fixed as well. Um, so one mistake that I made in my career was putting all of my eggs in one basket. I was working for a partner who uh, represented Michelin and John Deere and a number of other companies that were really great clients and he was the type of partner that gave associates responsibility. So I worked for him for about five years and worked only for him. It was my ninth year, I was about to make partner and he decided to leave the firm. So uh, he invited five associates that were working for him to go with him to this new firm. I went to the firm to interview and it just wasn't the right fit for me. And all of the other associates decided to leave with him. Three of them were my best friends in law school and they, the five of them were my closest friends at the firm. So it was um, a really, really hard decision. It was one of the hardest decisions I made in my career because I really wasn't sure what the future was going to be like for me because I wasn't working for any other partners at the time. So, and, and I was pregnant with my first daughter and my mother was critically ill. So I went to the head of my department and said, I've been here for nine years. I can see myself here in the long run. I'd really like to try to recreate myself here. And she found a number of opportunities for me um, and Long story short, I made partner that year. Um, I was one of the, I was the second partner at the firm to decide to work part, you know, I was, I told her that I wanted to work part time when I came back after I had um, Catherine. And, uh, and three of the five associates ended up coming back and they're the three people that I spend almost all of my time working with today. Okay. So, questions? So I'm an associate, which is, I'm 52. I really should be a partner, but I'm an associate, and I have no problem with that. Um, the 10 years that I spent working in financial fraud litigation, so from 2005, oh, longer actually, so from 2005 to 2018, I was a team leader um, at this firm <coughs> as a staff attorney, which is a non-partner, non-growth track and I was perfectly fine with that because at that point in my life my children were um, uh, 10 when I started so now they're in college and now I'm I'm happy to I have a much uh, you know I have a lot more responsibility managing all these settlement funds I work really long hours I, and so I could not have done that two or three years ago and so I think um, for as, a, as someone who with three children, it was really important, especially during the teenage years. If you think your kids need you when they're little, they actually need you a lot more when they're teenagers. So that was, um, that was a choice I made. And uh, I'm happy with it. I think well, I, don't, I don't have children. Um, my primary observation of this is I've, I've mentored and, and worked with a number of women who have successfully, beyond successfully, created that balance. And I think, it, so I look at it from the point of view of the, of the managing person in a situation where people are dealing with the unpredictable, unpredictable lives of their children. Um, you know, my own life, I've had a lot of responsibility for my parents and, and uh, other family members, and I know what it's like to just have your priority it has to be elsewhere. But, but the, the, the long-term commitment of, having, of raising children and being a lawyer is obviously a challenge. The key thing is to deal with things day to day, be flexible. Um, I think probably all of us have mentored people uh, who are uh, dealing with that balance. Um, be able to handle emergencies, be able to have, a, have a good relationships with your colleagues who are, 
who want you to succeed and will be will be willing to pick up in an emergency, handle a court appearance, <coughs> and so forth. So it is a tremendous challenge, but I have seen it done. The, the good news about for the younger generation is there you're going to have so many people who have forged this path already and can give you the, the advice that you need to make it successful. I, I agree with that. I think it also, I'm a mother of four, um, including uh, my kids are now in college, and um, I became a practice group leader, then a board member, and now on the management committee of my firm. Um, and my kids started in kindergarten and pre-K here um, while that while practicing. Um, I think you, there is a myth of having a total work-life balance. Um, and what I tell my uh, mentees is that you do have to recognize that there's never going to be a, a moment in time where there is complete work-life balance. Um, there are times where your professional life is really, really crazy, and you have to focus on that. Um, and that means that you need the support mechanisms and systems of your family and friends and colleagues to pick up the slack uh, in the other areas in order to have that true work-life balance. Um, and I do think it's easier now because people recognize that, and this generation is particularly focused on having more uh, uh, to life than just work. Um, and so you have more equilibrium. And then, you know, I tell my colleagues and the mentees the importance of um, having time for uh, yourself. Um, uh, the spiritual well being um, is really critical. Um, especially if you're the primary um, caregiver. Um, and so. And I just want to note, because I was uh, I served with Lorraine on the Stewart board, that Lorraine, with all of that going on, with uh, four unbelievably wonderful uh, young women that she was raising in this incredible career, gave so many hours to Stewart, because um, I was there to see it. Um, so just as an example, it, 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 the old adage is, if you need something done, ask a busy person. Well, that works. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think that um, there were many nights. When I, when I got promoted last year, it was my daughter's last summer, my youngest daughter's last summer, you know, senior year summer. And, and I got promoted in April, and I had always thought, oh, I'm gonna spend more time, and then in September, I'm gonna look to get promoted. And I got promoted because someone retired, and they needed someone actually with both account management skills, which I had from advertising, because I was managing, now I'm managing all this money and dealing with bankers. And, uh, and then the legal, they also had to understand what the legal ramifications of managing all this money was. And so a, a lot of nights I came home 9, 10 o'clock in a town car for Manhattan. So I didn't get that summer with my daughter. <laughs> and sometimes you're just not going to get it, but you get other things instead. Other questions? It, are we getting the hook? I think you are. We are. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I really want to thank our panelists um, and thank you for your wisdom today.